spoilers for the first two acts of the Archon Quest in Fontaine. So we got lots of lore for Fontaine. A secret society bent on dissolving everyone, Paimon's a rainbow balloon, people eat abyss dragon jam, Ray-Bans are canon? You name it. But we've been left as usual with more questions than answers. Like, Child was probably a child in Shaznaya when the serial disappearances started happening, so why did the Oratrice find him guilty? So I got to thinking about the Oratrice, and unfortunately for all of you, I've been feeling a bit chaotic lately, and it's time for some crackpot theories. Prepare your tinfoil hats, I'm going to be all over the place with this. The Oratrice Mechanique d'Analis Cardinal is a big scale in the Opera Epiclase. During trial, it will actively tip to either side, and at the conclusion of the trial, you have a Honkai Star Rail gotcha animation in which it takes the case notes and renders a judgment. During this process, the Oratrice takes people's belief in justice and converts it into an energy source, Indemnitium. Also, apparently it's always right and it also has a consciousness? Although it's not stated, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to make the assumption that it was made at the same time as the Opera Epiclase, which was a bit after the first flood, which was around the same time as the Cataclysm. As far as who made it, the general consensus by the Faunch is that the Hydro Archon created it to harvest energy from belief and power Fontaine using trials. However, Child's verdict clearly surprised Farina, and she gets flustered when we turn to her for answers. Nouvellet tells us she knows more about it than he does, but I'm not so sure about that. For one, there's a note implying that as a new Eudex, Nouvellet undertook organizing the building of the Upper Epoclase after the Cataclysm. There's also a line by Avel, the Melusine, who says it's all thanks to Nouvellet that Fontaine has a safe and reliable energy source, although she could be generally referring to trials that are a joy to watch. Now, to back up a little bit, Fontaine has two main energy sources. One is Indemnitium, created by the Oratrice. The other is the Arki system. When you use Arki to create an annihilation reaction, Numa and Ozia blocks disappear and, when contained in a controlled environment, create a cyan energy that can be harnessed. This was developed by Elaine Guillotine 400 years ago, so Arki and Indemnitium may have been created around the same time. But there's a line in a story that Al worked with Lord Neville to secure the future. In the Narcissenkreutz adventure, the characters reflect real-world counterparts, so to me this suggests that Elaine was working with Nouvellet around the same time as the construction of the Opera Epoclase. Perhaps this is in general the foundation of freaky or widespread use of clockwork mecha, but there are some things about energy that make me wonder. The Arki system is a result of Elaine's and Renee's research into Sumeru desert technology. Elaine called the primal constructs prime energy machines, and in the tutorials, all these mechanisms are primal lights or primal embers and so on. Now, everywhere you go in the desert, you see remnants of Deshret civilization, all characterized by a cyan glow in the architecture, devices, and machines. So, perhaps this cyan glow is primal energy. This primal energy seems to be unaligned pure energy, and it can take on elemental alignments. Primal embers turn into embers of fire, for example. There's a lot more to this, but fortunately a channel called My Name For Now recently made a video on the topic. But back to Annihilation Reactions. As I said earlier, Numa Osea reactions in a controlled environment can produce an energy that emits a cyan glow. Yes, we're color matching, folks. It's cyan. Just like what we see all over the Sumeru Desert. And Deshret's technology is what Elaine was studying. So it seems Numa and Osea can react and create balanced primal energy if contained. But annihilation reactions are not unique to Fontaine. For example, in Renee's investigation notes, he describes the interplay between Kavarna and Abyssal Power as an annihilation reaction. You can see the mutual destruction above the Vorakasha Oasis. And actually, you witness the annihilation reaction itself as you cleanse the tree's defilement and this unaligned energy bursts from the tree. It's super interesting how the new tree is also cyan. And as for another example, in the Hidden Dreams of Death's interlude quest, the gang talks about annihilation reactions, although they use the word opposing. In this context, they're stuck in a mysterious time space in the chasm and debating how it was opened in the first place. They come to the conclusion that the opposing reaction between the Divine Nail and the Ruin Serpent, which is driven by Dark Abyssal Power, somehow enabled this. Oh hey look, the nail is also kind of blue or cyan. That's crazy. 
So Traveler wonders if it was that reaction that opened the rift, or alternatively, if the opposing force delayed the space's awakening. I think it could go either way where an annihilation reaction opened up the space, or perhaps the nail, being connected to these various devices, was a controlled annihilation reaction, or contained primal energy, which was suppressing the space before the light links were severed. So there's a lot of speculation here, but this is all to say that it seems Arky, Deshret's technology, and the Divine Nail all seem to be based on this same primal energy. Furthermore, it's implied that we don't see a Divine Nail in Sumeru because Deshret used it to create the Eternal Oasis. So I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that the entire energy system of his civilization was derivative of the Divine Nail. Similarly, Arky would be derivative of Deshret's energy system. Oh, I almost forgot the Ortrees. The connection here is that when judgment is being rendered, indemnitium is produced and the various parts of the Ortrees glow cyan. We're color matching again, folks. But also, keep in mind, the Divine Nails are described as instruments of divine judgment and retribution. And, as an aside, the opera Epicles is in Araneas, which is named for three Greek goddesses of vengeance and retribution. So this is mostly just observation, and I'm not making any claims yet, but there are similarities between the Divine Nail and the Oratrice that I can't help but put in a pipe and smoke. But there's something else super important that I only just casually mentioned. The Oratrice has a consciousness which allows it to make accurate judgments. Navia even describes the Oratrice as the will of justice. This is the most confusing part, but also the most important, because we've heard about wills before. In his investigation notes, Rene studies Kavarna and Abyssal Power. He says that Kavarna and Abyssal Power are equal but opposite, and a level above elemental power. As such, they can rewrite the rules of the world. This is why Kavarna and the Pari are so good at repelling the Abyss. And, unlike raw elemental energy, and this is the really important part, both Kavarna and Abyssal Power have a will, or a form of self-recognition. It's also worth noting that Kavarna came from the Goddess of Flowers, who was a Sili, and the Goddess of Flowers even refers to Kavarna as her daughter. Even further, the Pari are essentially sentient forms of Kavarna. So, I hope it's more clear now why I spent so much time talking about Annihilation and Primal Energy. We're not just dealing with forces or phenomena or things. They seem to tread the line of being beings or entities. And to speculate a little bit more, maybe this is related to why Child was deemed guilty. Let me explain. So Child tells us about how he fell into the Abyss as a teenager. He had a dream about a giant whale, and this seems to have awoken an it within him. Traveler speculates it's linked to why his vision is malfunctioning, and maybe also his bad mood. We know that his foul legacy is derived from it, as Skirk recognized this it within him and trained him. And given the similarities with Abyss Lectors, you could perhaps think about it as a cosmic darkness within him. Imagine then, the Oratrice is like Kavarna in that it not only has a will, but also an opposition to the Abyss. This could maybe explain a guilty verdict. It recognizes the will of the Abyss within Child. This could also include some nuance about similarities between Child and Jacob, as Jacob's notes were used to develop synth, so perhaps he could tangentially be connected to the murder weapons. Okay, so I do recognize that I was just talking about a connection between the Oratrice and Divine Nails. But that's funny though, because Rene says that Kavarna is very similar to a crystal that he encountered. Given the fact that Divine Nails, like Kavarna, are super good at repelling the Abyss, and the entire discussion I had about Annihilation Reactions, I think he was referring to a Divine Nail. So the Oratrice shares similarities with both Kavarna and Divine Nails, and Divine Nails and Kavarna share similarities with each other. So, to recap, the Oratrice has self-recognition. It may be using a reaction to turn people's belief into indemnitium, which to me seems to be a form of primal energy. So again, I wonder if Elaine played a role in constructing this device, simply because Imagine this is an upscaled version of an Arky reaction. One that has a will and may be able to rewrite the rules. 
because you do have to remember that the people of Fontaine have a Numa or Osea alignment, and perhaps that carries over to their beliefs. Alternatively, maybe Farina just stuffed the Gnosis into some mechanical scale and gave it a kick and it started working. That all said, I do want to go back to the general topic of energy and will. But this is where it gets a little murky, because in the discussion of elemental energy and Kavarana and abyssal power, primal energy and annihilation reactions, it's not always clear what forms have a will and which ones don't. This is all to say I want to pose a kind of bonkers question. Do Divine Nails also have a will like Kavarana does? Like, even though they're both really good at repelling abyssal energy, to me, the Divine Nails seem to basically be primal energy crystals, which in itself wouldn't be indicative of a will. Well, you can probably guess that I'm really going to go off the rails here. <laughs> High octane crack theory warning. Your tinfoil hats won't protect you. Prepare your thermal, aluminized suits. There's an in-game book called Legend of the Shattered Halberd written by a guy named Mr. Nine. The story is about a man who goes on a journey with a woman possessed by the spirit of the God King slash Celestial Emperor's daughter. She's also the Princess of Condemnation. They need to collect the fragments of the Divine Halberd, which have been crafted into ominous swords, to prevent the destruction of the world. I have a video with a summary, so go watch that if you want the full story. Basically, the Shattered Halberd fragments were mistaken for meteorites and, like I said, used to forge weapons so it's a material. However, at the same time, the divine halberds from which the fragments originate are deities or beings with names. In the last chapter, the princess or the possessed woman we spend the entire story with is revealed to be the last divine halberd. So the book has this very confusing question about what exactly a divine halberd is. Is it a thing or a being? One interpretation is that the Divine Halberds represent spirits, and looking for the fragments is entirely metaphorical for looking for fragments of themselves. For example, in Dirge of Bilkis, we look for Lilupar's fragments so she can regain her memory. And when I say spirits, I specifically mean something Seely or Divine Envoy flavored. Lilupar has a true name that she tells to Traveler, giving them immense power over her. And Lilupar originated from the Goddess of Flowers, who was a Seely. Similarly, the princess of the story never reveals her true name, because revealing a true name gives someone control over them. But I had originally speculated that the Divine Halberds represented or were inspired by Divine Nails. This is largely due to how they're described. For example, being created by the God King, objects thrown from the heavens and mistaken for meteorites, and having a cleansing but also mind-altering property. So that's a second interpretation. But then I wondered about a third interpretation where both are true where the Divine Halberds represent both Divine Envoys and Divine Nails. This could imply, then, that the Nails derive their power from the same source as Seelys. Think about it this way. The Nail in the Chasm is called the Spirit Stone, perhaps a stone with a literal spirit. And we also learned about the weaponry of the Aramites being infused with literal spirits and Jin being infused into machines. Now, I know this is a lot, given that I've just thrown a book at you and also wrapped Seelys into the discussion, but consider this. Seelys are also cyan-colored, just like other forms of primal energy, and can take on an elemental alignment. They are remnants of a bygone race that have lost their form and cognition, but they do behave a lot like the motes of Kavarna, in that they guide the way to objectives or treasures, or help you solve puzzles. So these three interpretations are ideas that I cooked up before 3.6. Now, we have even more information about objects having a will, and forces also being entities. Kavarna and the Oratrice both have wills. I mentioned that the Goddess of Flowers referred to Kavarna as her daughter, and in the same vein, the God King also calls the last divine halberd, the princess, his daughter. In the final chapter, the God King even says about the princess, It, nay, she, shall unleash her true self. This implies that the Divine Halberds were ambiguously both an object and a being, or they gained sentience. 
So even regardless if the divine halberds specifically represent divine nails or not, this idea of will and self-recognition is there. And again, this is just speculation, but perhaps this is also commentary about the evolution of elemental life forms, from pure energy, gaining some sort of form, and also gaining will, sentience, self-recognition. This becomes a very, very interesting when you examine the fact that the divine halberds have names, and what those names are. We learn in a later work of Mr. Nine's that the last divine halberd, the Princess of Condemnation, is actually Fischl, the Princessin der Vertelung. This is the same character that Amy larps as. And for the record, Princessin der Vertelung translates to Princess of Judgment, which is interesting when you remember that divine nails are described as instruments of divine judgment and retribution, and the oratrice also renders judgment as well. And then there's the first Divine Halberd. This next part is even more unhinged than previous sections. No amount of tinfoil can save you here. So again, disclaimer, very, very creative speculation here. Yeah, creative, that's a good word, very generous. The last chapter of the book reads, The first Divine Halberd, Irmin, once pierced the Axis Mundi and connected the Nine Worlds. Outside of the book, Irmin is a very important name. He was the king of Conria. The book mention of Irmin seems to be referencing something Nasajuna said during Kavarna of Good and Evil, that Conria once connected the realms. Nasajuna is probably referring to when Conria took a little peeksy beyond the sky to spy on the secrets of the world, and even opening the rifts to the Void Realm. But Irmin has always been a point of confusion for me, particularly two things. Number one, why he shares his name with Irmin Sol. Well, first thing to note is that historically, IRL, Irmin Sol translates to Great Pillar, which makes me think more of a divine nail than a tree. But historical records show a connection to trees, and perhaps the pillar was simply an old tree trunk. But it's also interesting that when we go inside Irmin Sol with Scaramouche, its true form is more geometric, with a familiar cyan blue glow. All the information and memories of the world flow through it. The second thing is how Irmin is referenced in Legend of the Shattered Halberd. Irmin the Halberd is a thing, and its replicas multiplied across the heavens. And speaking of heavens, there is this issue of divinity, and Irmin being a divine halberd. Because as we all know, Conria was the peak of human achievement, and they were free from the rule of any gods or archons. So let me just summarize what we could maybe argue Irmin is. Human, he was the king of Conria, the pride of humanity. Seely, Irmin is a divine halberd, which may also represent divine envoys. I made a video on this. Dragon, I also made a video on this. Conrians may be evolved bishop people on the merit of Nibelung being the Dragon King, as Nibelung is also a race of dwarves in Wagner's Deer Ring des Nibelungen, which includes the Alberics. Also, they can only be distinguished from normal human beings by their unique eyes. Something related to a big data tree? All this discussion has gone back to inanimate things and energy having a will. Let me just be blunt with my insanity and suggest taking this a step further. Maybe he's the personification of the will of Irminsul. I mean, surely it's no coincidence that Conria is below Sumeru, and both Ruka Devada and Nahida are avatars of Irminsul. And we then also have a kind of similar situation with the goddess of flowers and Kavarna and the Pari. Maybe. I don't know. This is crack. Individually, all these ideas have merit, but I can't exactly reconcile any of them. But there's a commonality between three of them, and it's the color cyan. You heard it here first, folks. Move over, Scarlet King. King Irmin, the King of Conria, is the cyan king. I did leave someone out, though, so what about dragons? So back when Nouvellet was first revealed during the final feast, I made a post asking if people thought he was more Oceanid or Bishop looking. With new information, especially the legend of the Hydro Dragon and the Archon Quest making it very clear it's raining when Nouvellet is sad, yeah, yeah, he's a dragon. But in the 4.1 trailer, we got a preview of Nouvellet's animations, and watching them, I find him to actually be more sealy coated with his flowy coattails, the antenna, and also there's a lot of cyan, but I know that's probably just like his hydro alignment. But there's also a triquetra. This is a symbol I've always associated with Seelys, as you can see it on their courts. 
But thinking about if Nouvellet is more Oceanid or more Dragon or more Seely, I was reminded of a scene from the Narcissenkreutz adventure quest where they argue about whether Narcissus is a Dragon or Oceanid. So I wonder, if an Oceanid can be a Dragon and a Dragon can be a tree and Oceanids look like Seelies and a boar can be a dog, why can't a Seely be a Dragon if they're all sea slugs anyway? But in all seriousness, it makes sense that basically everything is tied to primal energy as it's, well, primordial. And there's probably a connection to the primordial sea which I haven't even thought about touching yet. So I still don't have any way to cleanly resolve all of this and I don't have any solid answers. But I do personally feel, no bias here, that there is something to the Cyan King and there is something there with primal energy. I just think it would be super funny because the Cyan King does not have the same ring as like the Scarlet King. And it's just a, a really happy color. <laughs> Listen, I told you guys this would be pretty unhinged, but thank you if you've made it this far in the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and yell at me in the comments, or compliment me on my amazing athleticism, the, <laughs> the Olympic level uh, mental gymnastics. I appreciate you all very much, and I co-host a stream with my friend Owl on twitch.tv slash owletdesu, so come by and catch us uh, be real silly or something. Okay, that's all. Bye!